it's a it's a huge pleasure today like to get your a little bit of insights from the world what is going on because uh, everyone is just reading the news uh, and, yes uh, yeah i mean it's such really an interesting stuff. kind there's such a lot to talk about <laughs> thank you so much okay great um yeah we already have uh, 30 guests so uh, maybe we start uh, thank you everyone for joining uh, tonight is Hannah O'Leary, uh, which is head and director of Contemporary African and Modern Art Department at Sotheby's famous auction house. And um, yeah, maybe in the beginning we can talk, how did you get into art and how did you get into, especially in the auction house or in the auction scene? Okay, um, well, um, I think the story is so boring. I studied the history of art at university. It was something I loved at school. I mm -hmm. proceeded um, to third level and without kind of a career in mind. Um, I just really loved the subject. And after university or during university, I spent a year abroad in Australia and I went back to Australia after I graduated and I got a job at Sotheby's, just a very entry level, um, we call them floaters. So I was taken on by whatever department needed me to, to help out with the auctions oh. that week, um, which was wonderful. I loved it. Um, and so when I came back to uh, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but when I moved back to London, so I was only in Australia on a kind of short-term visa, um, I joined uh, Bonhams. I knew I wanted to stay in the auction world. I thought that was really interesting and exciting. And London, London or New York were the obvious places to pursue that career. Mm -hmm. I knew I loved um, modern Australian art, which is what I had immersed myself in and what I'd written my master's thesis in. Mm -hmm. um, and... Also, I think living in Australia, I'd kind of gotten a taste of, um, I guess now looking back, you could talk, call it the global south, but kind of non-Western modern and contemporary art was something that I was starting to get interested in, non-mainstream geographies. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I joined Sotheby's, I had that knowledge of Australian, or sorry, when I joined Bonhams in 2006, um, I had that background in Australian art, but I was taken on as the specialist in charge of our travel and topographical sales. Um, that was within the British Watercolours Department. And I looked after these sales twice a year of anything that was kind of out, fell outside Europe. And um, so that was great with me for me with my um, interest in Australian art. But it also brought me to modern African art because we included anything African, both view African Africanist subjects, so views of Africa or, or African subjects by European artists, but also works by African artists and that's, um, that was so fascinating to me as a young graduate, as a researcher, uh, this was a whole world of, of subject matter I hadn't encountered at university, um, it was so rich, the art history and it the market, I mean it's funny to talk about it taking off, we started to see enough interest in the market within those kind of sales which were such a catch-all. Um, that uh, we decided to hold sales just of South African art because South African art started selling very well within those sales. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then it kind of escalated from there. So I was working on the travel sales as well as the South African sales and then mm -hmm. started selling some Nigerian art in the travel sales and Nigerian collectors were saying you should have a Nigerian sale. And very soon the African subject matter really took over um, yeah. became kind of more than half or 90% of what I was doing and, and sure enough finally the the travel and topographical sales were handed over to somebody else and I, I took on African art 100% mm -hmm. um, so by 2010 I was I was made head of head of department um, mm -hmm. and we were having two African sales and two South African sales a year so mm -hmm. um, and I was still in my 20s so it was a pretty it was pretty quick rise even though kind of looking back those those years were so formative in, in the market, but mm -hmm. um, the escalation and growth in the past 10 years has been so much quicker, but yes. that's how I got into it. Yes, okay. And it, by accident, it wasn't a career path that I set out for myself. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, especially like now, like that, let's say African contemporary, like become, let's say like very trendy and, and um, how like, how do you perceive this? Like, and, and especially in how do you set up an uh, auction or like the next auction, uh, for, for example, like in, uh, which is now uh, end of the year? Um, well, those are two very different questions. Um, trendy, I mean, it's cool. There's no doubt about it. I mean, it's such a cool subject matter. Um, I think those who have been involved have always known that. Um, 
if you mean trendy as kind of a, a, a trend that's that's not going to hang around for a long time, I, I disagree with that wholeheartedly. Yes, uh, yes. you know, I don't, I don't, and I get we get that accusation a lot. I don't think you can dismiss a continent mm. as a trend. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's a really rich and substantive subject matter um, mm. that's here to stay, and. I, when I joined Sotheby's in 2016, um, they were very aware that this was a huge subject area and a huge geography, you know, a huge part of the world that, that they had been neglecting and that they were keen to correct. So, um, we, so we had our first sale uh, less than three years ago, which is crazy to, to me yeah, to think yes, about. Yes, I remember. Um, which is around the same time we met for the first time, Oliver, I think. Yes, uh, yes. 2018, I think, or beginning or end of 2017, I think, we met, yes. We had a sale in May 2017. I remember that it was, um, uh, Sotheby's take things very seriously and and tread into these new markets very carefully. And they said, well, we'll try a sale and then maybe we'll do one sale a year. And I, I kind of came in saying, you know, there's going to be a huge demand for this. Maybe the numbers won't be, won't blow you away. You know, Sotheby's will have yeah. a week of the year where they sell a billion dollars worth of art. That, that's yes, yes. sadly not, we're not there yet. <laughs> but the interest, the, the press interest and the excitement from our collectors is going to be huge. Um, and sure enough, um, you know, the, the, the launch of our sales made a huge impact we had a huge amount of press. We had a lot of new buyers. We had a lot of excitement. And, and kind of from the get-go, I was encouraged to do two sales a year, get involved um, in other sales that we're doing where we could include more African artists. Mm -hmm. And it's been just kind of super busy since then. So you say our next sale is at the end of the year. Um, we just had a sale at the end of March, which um, I hope we talk about because it was that crazy week that we faced our shutdown here in, in London. Yes. Um, and then our next live auction um, will, of, of contemporary African art will take place in October. Um, but in the meantime, we have a sale, online sale next week, which mm -hmm. is called Eclectic, in which we have a section of contemporary African art. Mm -hmm. um, that happens quite regularly where I work with a, either with another department or mm -hmm. on a multi-department sale. Um, where we're including, you know, you'll find not a huge amount, but you will find contemporary African art and artists included in our auctions year round. And yeah. so that keeps me busy every single week. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, great. And um, like currently, like, as you said, like mostly like online auctions, like uh, taking place in, in, in every in every matter. Um, like, do you think like we had like a very successful, let's say, public auctions before the pandemic scene? Do you think like this might impact uh, the online auctions? Do you think they will grow, let's say, similar or at a certain point when the pandemic scene is like taking over the public auctions will take over and the online auctions will, let's say. Yeah. Um, I think this is a discussion we're having both publicly and internally all the time. Yeah. Um, online sales are here to stay. That's it's yeah. something that we as a company have been really invested in. We've been growing year on year. Mm -hmm. um, before any hint of coronavirus, we were um, building our number of, of online sales. Um, mm -hmm. I think, I believe the turnover year on year has grown about 50%, which is huge um, mm -hmm. in online sales. Um, and so we were, and it was something the company was heavily invested in. So um, we, I felt very lucky that we, um, that I worked for a company that had that platform and that investment when this whole shutdown came about and when we were forced, um, you know, to close our doors and, and we, we realized we couldn't have a, a live sale. So the situation in our most recent auction was um, we were supposed to sell on the afternoon of the 25th of March. Mm -hmm. um, and the government shut down all the auction houses on the night of the 23rd of March. So, I mean, it was, you know, less than two day, <laughs> days away, um, which was stressful, not because I didn't think we could sell online, um, mm -hmm. but there's a huge amount of work behind the scenes to kind of rebuild the sale as an online sale. Um, so we took a breath, we took a week out, and we, we put the sale online within a week. Um, and I felt... Um, I mean, grateful both that we had the platforms, but also it's funny when we're all working from home, um, just how kind of tight knit Sotheby's is a very communal, social place to work. And I felt mm -hmm. very supported by that net network of colleagues who, who were all invested in making sure our sale went ahead and was a success. Um, so the 
I was worried that I, I guess my, um, I think the ideal scenario is that we allow people to participate in our sales in any way that they feel comfortable. Yeah. So if they want to bid online, that's great. If they would rather come in and bid in the room, we, we want to be able to facilitate that. If they want to bid on the telephone, we want to facilitate that. Yeah. Um, it was disappointing that we were kind of limiting how people could bid. Um, but I was really encouraged by by our clients' responses. I, I don't think we lost any bidders because of the platform. Um, people who have previously always shown a, a preference for bidding online or on the telephone or bidding in the room or on the telephone understood the situation. This is a worldwide crisis and we're all yeah. in the same situation. And most people... Um, Everyone was just delighted that we were able to make the sale go ahead. They had already kind of decided what they were going to bid on. We had already had the conversations about strategy and interest and that kind of thing. Um, and so maybe it was a little bit of um, tutorials and how to online bid, but actually it's a really, really simple, straightforward process. We've worked really hard to, you know, um, uh, uh, what's the word? Over, you know, we've learned a lot from from building these sales online. So we're able to refine the process, and I hope it's it's pretty straightforward. I've bid in our not in my own sales, but I've bid online through our platform, and it's yeah. pretty seamless. So, and the feedback after the sale, it was the same that people thought that it was a really easy way to bid. Um, and the other thing I think I was worried about was. With a live auction with an auctioneer in the room, there's a lot of tension and drama, yes, and, yes, yes, and that's a part of the beauty of the auction. Yes. Um, but again, the fee I mean, I certainly felt it watching it as the, the, the head of the sale. A lot of that theatre comes across in online bidding. It's, it's crazy that you have a sale that's open for bidding over a course of a week, but yes. you come down to the final kind of 60 seconds, and yes. suddenly everything goes crazy. So you're watching yes. all of this bidding online. So it's... Um, it can be exciting and theatrical as well. So yeah. I think I know that online sales are here to stay. Um, they're developing all the time. Um, I hope before too long we'll be back in, in the sale room. I know we have kind of very um, optimistic, well, we have a very carefully thought out plan for yeah. when we are allowed to do that. Um, but I'm sure it's going to be months and months before, you know, yeah. people are attending live auctions um, comfortably. Um, or in any great numbers. So it's something that we not have to get used to. I just think that we're embracing it. And the success of the sales has been really encouraging, not just our sales. So our sale, um, we made uh, £2.4 million, which is wow. both the largest online sale of African art, but also yeah. up on the same sale this time last year. And we saw an increase of 50% of the number of bidders on the same time last year. Okay. So a huge success all round. Um, um, and our sales at Sotheby's have been increasing all year, not just online. If you compare um, the same period, so this year where we've just had online sales, but the same period last year where we've had live and online sales, mm -hmm. I believe sales are up. Our sell-through rate is up. I think the average sell-through rate is about 85%. Um, and on average, we're seeing like a third of our bidders new to the company, which is one of the most exciting things about online sales is it, it, it reaches corners of the earth that, that, that we don't and clients that we don't know. So that's been really exciting. Yeah. Probably even more younger people like getting more into. Oh, the, that was the uh, other statistic that blew me no? away. So a third of our buyers in online sales are under the age of forty, which is really oh, not okay. the demographic that we are <laughs> okay. having in our live sales. Um, so that's really exciting as well. And of yes. course, that makes sense. They're more comfortable maybe with the format. Um, but these are, I mean, they're bidding large amounts of numbers, and I don't know um, the age of every single buyer, but you know we've. We've sold a few million pound lots over the last month, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and those young buyers. And for ex I, I believe the buyer of the Basquiat two years ago for one hundred and twenty million dollars. Yes. Um, I believe that was a very very young buyer. Yes. Yes. Uh, under forty again. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we sold a bottle of whiskey in our first whiskey sale um, mm -hmm. less than six months ago um, for one point five million, I think. Wow. Um, was the number, and that buyer was in his 20s. So, so okay. this is really exciting. Not just that we're bringing in younger buyers, but also, of course, they're going to be the they're going to be built they're at the beginning stages of building their collections, and so hopefully, they're going to be lifelong clients of ours as well.
Great. And do you have the feeling like currently, um, okay, I'm just imagination, like some some collectors rather now, let's say, stick to their uh, pieces and don't want to sell, and some others, like say, they have to sell because of maybe some financial trouble. Um, do you have, uh, how, how is your feeling? Do you get a lot of, uh, let's say, requests? Can you evaluate? I want to sell, no, I need to sell, no. Or is it rather the other way around that the people, let's say, um, store their stuff for, let's say, better times? Yeah, um, I mean, it might be a little too early to tell. Um, I do, I mean, I'm not, you know, we're not, none of us are ignorant of the fact that we're in for kind of a, yeah. an interesting time economically over the next few months, if not years. Um, certainly, I've been through a couple of recessions um, in the industry. I remember in 2008. It's really interesting. The art world doesn't necessarily follow exactly how kind of stocks and shares would follow. So you find a lot of people will be buying art during recession times um, because it's, a, you know, a, a, um, a physical asset. Um, but also there are advantages to be had. So the re your first question is to people selling. Um, people sell all the time for all sorts of different reasons. Um, sometimes it's something as simple as, as a, a death or a divorce or, um, of course, debt. It's, you know, the, the 3D yeah. we're all taught about. <laughs> what, um, <laughs> now it's a lot of debt and probably not sale. Yeah. People also sell because the time is right. And that's, mm -hmm. um, that's a really important part of my job is advising clients on their collections, yeah. on the valuations and telling them, you know, think about selling now where, you know, everyone's looking for that piece that you have or that artist that you have. They're mm -hmm. really hot right now. They've got a show at Tate. They've got a show at MoMA. This is, this is your time to, to kind of take advantage of that moment. Um, and those shows and those, those nuances in the market are going to continue in good times and in bad. Um, the, so people sell for all sorts of reasons. And, of course, people might feel forced to sell. They might need to kind of uh, raise some cash. And, and auction is a really kind of straightforward way to do that. Yeah. Um, but like I say, at the same time, I think it's a It's not a bad time to sell. People will buy. And mm. even talking to people um, after my auction, like I said, the number of bidders was up. And yep. lots of people said that they wanted to take, not just take advantage of what was coming up um, at the moment, you know, feeling that they might get a, a, a leg up on people who were otherwise distracted at the moment. Yeah. Um, but also the nature of art is that these pieces are unique. And if you find a painting that you love, You know, it might be your one and only chance to buy it. If you, if you don't buy it and it goes into somebody else's collection, you may never see it again. Yeah. So the art market, like I say, kind of moves in different ways. Um, but I do think we've got interesting times coming ahead. Yes. Okay, great. No, I, I'm very curious as well. Um, what I, uh, let's say, uh, recognized in the last years, like um, that artists who are sought after, they are rather, let's say, put into the day and evening auctions. Uh, for example, like in, in uh, although they are somehow related to the contemporary African or its diaspora, um, like is it like kind of normal? Does it hurt your department in a way, um, or is it in the end like okay, we are all just yeah. one auction house? So, um, but how is this kind of feeling? Because so it definitely doesn't hurt my department. We're we're one mm -hmm. Sotheby's, we're one auction house. We work together. Yes. We work um, our. Our client, our, our main interest is the seller, so we want to work in the seller's interest. Um, and it, with that in mind, we want to do um, the best thing for for the painting. Where is where is the painting going to, or the object going to perform the best? Um, it's an interesting question. When I, it was never my intention. It's never been our intention to take African artists out of the mainstream or out of yeah. international sales. That's absolutely not what we're here for. It's it's the opposite. Yeah. Um, when I joined Sotheby's, there were very few African artists who were being offered in mainstream international yeah. auctions at Sotheby's or at any of the other auction houses. So um, I usually talk about the, the kind of five. I can list them on one, one hand. Um, they would be Julie Moretti from Ethiopia, yeah. uh, Wangeshi Mutu from Kenya, Marlene Dumas, William Kentridge from South Africa, and Alana Tsui from, from Ghana. Um, so those are kind of the five artists who are who are known really known internationally. Yeah. Um, I mean, most of those artists, apart from Elle and Kentridge, uh, don't live in Africa and haven't lived in Africa since they were teenagers. So yeah. they're really kind of in the diaspora. Yeah. Um, 
And I've been really encouraged and delighted that I've been able to, since I joined Sotheby's and, and put a department together, we've been able to work alongside our contemporary department and other departments um, in, in putting more African artists into international sales, providing them with expertise, and then obviously making sure that our clients, the African clients or the buyers who are kind of following African sales are also aware of those works. So since, since, since we founded the Contemporary African Department, we've seen you know, people like Enjadek Akineli Cosby or Toyonoja Ototola um, or even, um, who else has been, uh, Michael Armitage making these yes. great results in our contemporary sales. Um, and we've you know, been, been working on that with them, but also those artists, I guess, as well as a lot of them kind of work, not just working or living in the diaspora, um, most of them will have major gallery representation as well. Yes. Yes. Um, the contemporary market is, slight, is very different to the contemporary African market. I feel like um, what we do in our contemporary African sales is building a market. So we're trying to build these reputations on the secondary market, um, educate our, our, our buyers about these artists. And then obviously as the, as the price is built, then hopefully they can kind of be, go into a day sale or an evening sale. Mm -hmm. um, often if an artist is introduced to a day sale too early, if they're, you know, if they're not overhyped, they can get yeah. lost in a day sale and, and not kind of achieve the result that you were hoping for. So it's a, it's a discussion we have with every consignment. Um, you know, what's the best thing for this piece and what, what does the client want? And, um, some, and sometimes we mix it up. There are artists that sell in both contemporary sales and African sales, or mm -hmm. also photographs and prints and African sales. Um, like I say, where will we get the best result? What does the client want? And sometimes it's just down to timing or location. Um, yeah. But it's a discussion with every consignment, and we very much work together on that. Okay, 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 great. Okay, um, in, in our last talk uh, as well, I already asked this question, like um, that would be interesting as well to know your opinion your opinion, uh, since the contemporary African market is still like less than uh, 1% in the total market uh, in comparison to US with 44%, um, uh, the UK 21 and China 19%. Um, what do you think needs to be done like to change uh, or somehow raise this, uh, let's say, percentage in terms of the total market? Yeah, I mean, it's so at odds with the um, size and population of Africa and the mm -hmm. potential. That's what gets me excited is the potential of this market. Mm -hmm. um, there are steps being taken in the right direction. Obviously, sales are growing. Obviously, there are more African artists being picked up by, by commercial galleries, big commercial yeah. galleries and international institutions. And, you know, there's, there are certain um, key factors, like a formula that you could put together for a, an artist to become a superstar. Are they kind of being shown at the Venice Biennale? Are they, do they, yeah. have they come to the attention of the curators at MoMA? That, those kind of things. And, and we're seeing more African artists represented in those kind of major stages. Yes. Um, but the other thing I think that needs to happen is um, developments on the continent, um, both in kind of private collecting. I think that, mm -hmm. um, and certainly I spend a lot of time trying to understand who are the important artists, who are the who who do my African clients want to collect, who do they value? Um, but they have to be valued accordingly, and uh, they have to have opportunities on the continent as well. So you know the number of. Uh, institutions where you can show your work as an artist on the continent yeah. are very few but they are growing rapidly you know yeah. in the last two or three years we've seen contemporary art museums opening in south africa um in togo in uh M morocco um they they are growing but if you compare the number of those facilities to any other continent the, yeah. the numbers are tiny so I think that's really crucial. There's more opportunities on the continent. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah, I'm looking forward that this will grow. Um, do you think like uh, current like being like um, a fact that the African residency or diaspora can affect somehow the discourse or the content of the art uh, in in artist career like in general like currently because uh, well, it's like very much talked about. Um, do you think it? It could somehow affect it. So, so, do you think that um, being a, being a, like an African artist is could could is an advantage or a disadvantage to their career? Uh, currently, for example, like uh, like in general, like 
because everyone is talking about it. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, th I think that's a slight mistake. I think a lot of people think that um, being an African artist, the same way they're talking, people are talking about ethnicity, the same way, the way they talk about kind of female artists or um, LGBTQ artists yes, yes. Um, as having an advantage that everyone's looking for those artists. Um, I, that has been actually disproven to a certain um, extent by mm -hmm. a couple, there have been some really interesting studies in this area. Yeah. Um, so our Sotheby's advisory group, um, art agency partners, actually partnered up with Artnet and they did a major survey, I think in 2018 on African-American mm -hmm. artists and in 2019 on female artists, both areas of the market where people were saying that there, you know, that there, it was an advantage to be a female artist or an African-American African artist, that they were being collected more than anyone else. And actually they proved that wasn't true, that they were still massively underrepresented in the marketplace. Um, and I would say the same, we haven't done one for African art yet, um, but I would say the same thing about African artists, even though it sounds like there's a lot of hype, there's a lot of talk and a lot of people mm -hmm. looking for African artists. The representation still isn't there. People still don't understand um, yeah. what to look for. Um, yeah. and, and there's often a lot of confusion between African art and African-American art, um, yeah. especially in, in the United States as well. So I, I still think there's an, a, the artists who are in living in America or Europe are have, have an advantage over those living on the mm -hmm. continent. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think I think in the end, like um, it's only as well not just not just about this. Let's say uh, the description, what what you are, what you're not. It's about the art, I guess. If the yes. art is great, if the art is good, then it's of course. It, and it, and it I think I mean, well, so. the, the amazing thing is every time we have an uh, an exhibition at Sotheby's, and so mm -hmm. it's heartbreaking that we weren't able to have an exhibition this season. Oh yes, oh, uh, not this, always. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best if you go to the pre yeah, or it, day it, options. I mean, there's a lot that can be done online, but. The, the joy in art is actually experiencing it in person. Yeah. And we, you know, Sotheby's have these galleries that are open to the public seven days mm -hmm. a week with amazing exhibitions, whether it's African art or jewellery or watches or whatever. Um, and so we have our clients coming in, but we have a lot of people coming through our galleries who have not come specifically for the, for the subject matter um, or they've come to see a specialist in another department. And the feedback that we get from our African sales is amazing people are fascinated by what we're doing we're really excited by the content they all yeah. come and they say like this is a great show why have i never heard of these artists before and that's how i felt when i first kind of great. started working in the field <laughs> there's these are world-class artists there's no doubt about it it's something we yeah. pride ourselves on that we maintain the same kind of standards as as any of our colleagues um and we want to put on a world-class exhibition and what what kind of brings it together is that these are, are artists from Africa, um, but it's a great contemporary art show. And yeah. it's, it, you know, it's disappointing that they haven't been discovered yet, but they're there to be discovered. And we have so many new buyers with every sale um, and not just new to the, to the, to the company, but, but new to the subject. You know, a lot of, we have a lot of buyers who collect international art, contemporary art, um, mm -hmm. and are excited to add, you know, pieces from our sale to that as well. So, yeah. Yeah, the qual of course the quality is there. I, I always say that. I mean, art is, it, you know, can, talent can be found in every corner of the world. It's whether yeah. the kind of infrastructure exists for an artist, a talented artist in rural Chad to come to the attention of a collector in Germany. You yeah. know, uh, yeah. it's not just the, the talent that's at play there. There's a lot more at play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, great. Um, like last, last, last but not least, uh, because um, like um, then we hand over to the community. You can already prepare the questions uh, at the community. Um, do, can you give some advices for young collectors um, how to start, let's say, successfully in a collection, and then as well, especially like in contemporary African art? Okay. Um, what would you recommend? I, I think it's a, a cliche, but it, but because it's absolutely true, buy what you love. I think mm -hmm. you know you should have a reaction to to an artwork and and mm -hmm. if it doesn't speak to you then maybe it's not for you i mean yeah. that that's first and foremost in my mind um i think i would read up about artists follow mm -hmm. them on social i mean it's so exciting today 
uh, the the accessibility that we have to the art world and to artists mm -hmm. themselves. You know, follow them online, follow their galleries. Kind of, there, there are so many resources um, out there that are publicly available, um, and not just not just that, but I, you'll find that auction houses and galleries are really those of us who work in in this field um, are really passionate about our subjects. We love yeah. speaking about it. We give a lot of <laughs> free advice. So I would definitely say, like, don't be shy. Get yes. in touch with people, um, ask their opinions, get a second, third opinion. If you're not, you know, if you don't feel sure yourself, don't, don't, you know, don't feel shy about coming to an expert and, and talking to them about it. I, I think we all love talking about our subject matter. Um, I personally, um, I often find that like certain galleries will um, just work for me. You know, I like the aesthetic of, of one gallery more so than another and I'll kind of follow what they're doing really really closely um so like one of my favorite galleries would be Tawani Contemporary here in London I think they, they have some amazing artists who are very much to my taste I'm not you know I'm not saying that they're um going to be to everyone's taste but that means that I'll keep a, a closer eye on on the new artists that they're introducing um and more often than not I think you know that they, we're, we're very well I'm I feel that like I'm very much in sync with them mm -hmm. taste wise um, and and if you're willing to, I, I think it's wonderful to kind of take a punt on a on a new young artist, uh, yeah. somebody who hasn't made a name for themselves just yet. Um, it's what a wonderful thing to kind of support a young artist by work from their first show and give them the kind of confidence to go on and, and pursue that career. And you know, when it comes to investment, I think that should be secondary. But how great then if you can show kind of two three years later that you followed them from the beginning um that that they do make a name for themselves and they, i don't think there's any greater reward yeah yeah okay well wow, cool but i love always this about that the cool thing at like when you have like the auction oh and buy an auction <laughs> 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 well i mean <laughs> i think it's a combination of the both i don't think um I would never put all my eggs in one basket, uh, even though, yeah. like, there, you know, there are artists that I love. I would never have yeah. all of my collection one artist. Yeah. Um, and there are different things I go to. And like I said at the beginning, I think people want to collect in different ways. And there are, yeah. there are different pieces that I would buy from a gallery than mm -hmm. I would buy at auction. Um, yeah. But auctions are also really interesting because, first of all, they can teach you a, a lot. The secondary market is obviously where you can see what has a what has a beyond the gallery client the client sorry the buyer client gallery relationship yeah uh, or the artist gallery relationship what kind of has a life beyond that as well so what what, what has a, a, a resale value what historic pieces are coming up because mostly galleries will be dealing in in newer works um and you can discover all sorts of kind of exciting weird and wonderful things at auction so whether you buy an auction, I would I'd definitely keep an eye on, on what's coming up at auction too, because those are real kind of market makers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I like always about auction that you have like the catalog and you have like several, let's say, artists, directions, aesthetics, and it's it's cool, like it's very cool that you can, let's say, somehow find your aesthetic or even sometimes some new artists uh, and new names. Uh, on the other side, if you go to a gallery or to maybe two, three galleries, you just have uh, like a, some pieces available by a certain artist which just opened or something like this. And that's a cool thing that you somehow get a summarize of a current uh, market statement and even artist. Um, and you can somehow select very, very carefully what you like, what you don't like, and even what fits to your pocket in the end as well. But also, one of my favorite things about our sales, the contemporary African sales, is that um, it, this field, this uh, the African art world, modern and contemporary, mm -hmm. um, most of the galleries are, at the moment, focused on 21st century work. Yeah. So most of the galleries that, that have artists on their books will be younger, obviously living um, artists, which is great. I mean, there's some amazing young artists out there. Um, but a lot of the, one of the things that I want to tell with my auctions is that contemporary art in Africa is not a new thing at all. I mean, if anything, so many of our modern European artists were influenced by African artists. Yeah. And so I really want to tell that art history of the 20th century um, African artists. And a lot of them don't have representation at galleries with galleries. So you're not going to see their work um, in commercial galleries, but you will find it at auction. 
Um, so that's one of my favorite things about, about kind of the platform that we provide. Cool, very cool. Okay, great. We already had some great questions here. I mm -hmm. think with mine. Um, Here's an interesting question. Uh, how do you prize pioneer artists from Africa uh, who have never been sold at auction? Okay. <laughs> so uh, people ask me this a lot. Uh, the funny thing about auctions, the kind of catch-22, is that usually you have to have sold at auction to sell at auction. We all kind of look at a database of results and say, oh, well, you know, this certain comparable works have come up several times and therefore we, we can guess it's going to make this price. Um, again, one of the things I love about my subject area is that um, I have a little bit more freedom to introduce artists to auction or introduce them to kind of obviously a major auction house when maybe they had kind of been selling in, in smaller auctions before. Um, and then how you price them, it can be a shot in the dark. Um, it's a combination of knowing the primary market yeah. So I work really hard on my relationships with galleries and artists and trying to understand how things are selling on the primary market. Um, and obviously, if we are going to put something at auction, um, trying to bear in mind what, what it might sell um, for at their gallery. Um, and we try and, and um, have that conversation with the galleries as well, whether, you know, whether we, we don't you know, we'll, we'll flag with them if something is coming up at auction and yeah. give them the opportunity to, to tell us if we got it right or wrong. Yeah. Um, if, and the other, I mean, I remember talking to the Tate a few years ago and they were saying when they started collecting African art, they had mm -hmm. that problem because they were going to the artists and they didn't know, there was no, there was no price tag. Yeah. Um, and so they were saying, well, what would a, what would a comparable contemporary Middle Eastern artist sell for? Um, so yeah. sometimes it's kind of a like for like. If, if this artist, you know, is, is selling for this much and this guy is just as important as a, just as many kind of in, interesting museum shows, then, then maybe they should be comparable. Yeah. Um, yeah. We do, I mean, the thing about auction is that we're, unlike a gallery which sets its price and sometimes there's a little bit of negotiation going on, we kind of set a low bar and then hope yeah. that people kind of bid against each other. So sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll put an estimate kind of low to encourage bidding and then hopefully the bidders on the day will, will determine the market value. Yeah. Yeah. And then that sets precedence for next time. And then as well, like um, there as well, there are a lot of let's say rumors or as well like th theories that uh, how you place a piece in in the terms of the auction, like is it in the beginning, uh, in the middle, or in the end? Uh, let's say there are these kind of uh, theories. Okay, here, okay, the first five will do extremely well, and there is there are so because they're right in the beginning. Then it's going down. In the middle, it's going a little bit more up. Um, yeah. I, I heard a lot about these rumors and about these how you plan the catalog. Can you we, somehow tell um, a little bit about this? It's funny, we get a lot of requests from sellers um, mm -hmm. who think they know all of the kind of psychology of, 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 of that. So yeah. we'll have requests of not in the first half of the catalog, not in the second half of the catalog, <laughs> not on number 10. You know, we'll try and accommodate those. Um, a great piece is a great piece and people mm -hmm. will make sure they're there at the beginning or wait until the end if that's yeah. what they want. Um, we try to have a rhythm in our auctions, so we mm -hmm. definitely want to start strong. So we usually mm -hmm. start with something that we know is going to get lots and lots of interest. You don't want to start a sale with four, five, six unsold pieces because that's going to set a terrible tone for the rest mm -hmm. of the sale. So we definitely want to start with pieces that are well-priced and are going to get, get lots of bidders. Um, but otherwise, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't believe... We, I've seen I've seen pieces sell for twenty times their estimate any any place in the catalogue or any part of yeah. the sale that you put them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, great. No, <laughs> it was as well like another question. It just popped up in my head. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. This one is like yeah, strategically as well the same. Um, is there, yeah, okay, is there a fear that African art is perhaps just a trend or once saturated the buyer, once saturated the buyer will uh, latch in onto the next big thing? Um, I guess you as well somehow explained a little bit in the beginning. Uh, maybe yeah, can... I, did, I did a little, uh, I don't think it's a trend. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, Like I said, I don't think you can call a continent a trend. There is, and as you said, you know, we're talking about less than 1% of this contemporary art market. And actually, we're talking about almost 20% of the world's population live in Africa Mm -hmm. and 54 countries. It's absolutely vast and they're not going anywhere. It's the fastest growing continent on the planet. Um, So we've got to see that discrepancy um, Mm -hmm. tighten. So this market is going to grow and grow and grow. But I think the growth is really going to come, um, I, I think, from African buyers and people who are really invested in, invested in emotionally, um, you know, not, not necessarily financially in the market. I think there are some people who are speculating and there will always be in the art world. People sit thinking that's going to be the next big thing. I'm going to get in here early and, and off yes, those early. Yes, yes. But there, there actually aren't that many. Um, we have in our sales, we probably have... 200 bidders, 200 buyers per sale. Mm-hmm. Very few of those are those kind of speculators. Mm-hmm. I think most people are really enthusiastic about what we're doing and about the artists that they're buying. So I, I don't think it's a trend. Maybe we'll, like I say, maybe we'll see the kind of demographic of the people who are buying change. Um, mm-hmm. But I, we're going to see more growth in this area. Okay, great. Uh, here's another question by Serge. Um, how do you choose between uh, commerciality and historical significance? And uh, what role does your personal taste play uh, in these roles? Um, I'd like to think my personal taste doesn't come into it, but maybe it does a little bit. Okay. <laughs> I no, it, well, I, I I work really hard not to. I mean, I <laughs> I refer to my team constantly as to what <laughs> they think, and we, we have, and it's the same with every department at Sotheby's. We it's never about one person's taste and opinion we have these kind of pricing meetings every single day where we discuss works that are coming in so it's not one person's um Mm -hmm. aesthetic by any means um i having said that i do have a preference for um not necessarily historic work but artists who have a institutional following i think Mm -hmm. that adds value so if an artist has come to the attention of some great institutions or some kind of key curators then then they're going to go into my auctions. It's one of the criteria I use. If if Okwe in Wesor was a fan of that artist, then he should probably, or she should probably be in our sales. Mm-hmm. Um, there are other artists, there are lots of artists who are doing really well in the primary market who actually maybe have a following on the secondary market who have never had an institutional yes. show. Um, and I sometimes wonder why that is and, and kind of the longevity of, of their careers um, because I, I do I put a lot um, of emphasis on on that institutional following mm-hmm. okay okay um, oh, this, we have to find some artists which we uh, some questions we haven't talked about Sorry, this really... um, Yeah, okay. Like again, like how you, how do you, let's say, set up the catalog, uh, selecting the artists before putting a show together? Um, like as I said, like do you somehow select? Okay, this artist will might be do better in the uh, evening and day auction, and this could be work in in your catalog better. Or how does it work? Like how do you set up in the end? Um, mostly. Mostly it's whether, an, hmm, yeah, that's a good question um, because it's not on value necessarily. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's more on the kind of how widespread, how well known an artist is. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, the day sales, the contemporary sales are, are absolutely huge. And um, I think I said before, a, a work can get lost in those sales if you don't have the kind of specialist um, knowledge and, and kind of um, focus that we can provide in an African sale. Um, and I'll often find that, that those people who collect contemporary African art really follow our sales very closely and are less interested in our day sale, yeah. which can be surprising to some people. Mm-hmm. So if an artist is... With a major gallery, if they're showing with David Swerner or Victoria Miro or White Cube, as there are some African artists who do, 
then they're probably going to have a following among that international art buying community, mm-hmm. and then they're probably going to go in an, in an international sale, so a day sale or an evening sale. Um, otherwise, they're they're most likely going to go into an African sale. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, great. And uh, which countries are you very excited about outside of uh, African contemporary or in uh, South Africa and Nigeria? (laughs) Well, South Africa and Nigeria are the biggest markets. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean I'm the most excited by them, although I love both those countries. Um, And also Morocco. So those are the three largest Mm -hmm. markets in in our field, and that's why they're the most represented in our sales. Okay, okay. Um, The countries that I'm excited about, uh, I always go to Zimbabwe. Yeah. Um, Zimbabwe, I think, um, has such an amazing amount of talent for very little infrastructure, um, mm-hmm. art world infrastructure. Um, you know, there are a couple of really great galleries and there's the National Gallery, but really um, it's quite surprising how, how many amazing, young, talented artists who are so um, unique um, and... Uh, uh, are coming out of Zimbabwe. So that's one place which, which I always talk about. Um, I think Ghana is really interesting um, because I think they're building a really interesting infrastructure. I know they have elections coming up, but if the president stays in power, I think this new museum that's being planned there is really interesting. So more of a kind of institutional um, public uh, platform for, for the arts than the commercial um, area. Mm-hmm. Where else? I, I think East Africa, because it was it hadn't the the market kind of grew from South and West Africa, um, and North Africa has always kind of had a following among Middle Eastern um, with the Middle Eastern sales. Um, mm-hmm. East Africa, I'm really interested in uh, Uganda, Sudan. Um, mm-hmm. Sudan obviously has this really rich art history. Um, Ethiopia. These are all places oh, I want cool. to travel more in and visit more. Yeah. I, I think they all have really exciting artists, some of whom are in our sales. I think there are many more that we're yet to discover. Mm-hmm. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, those are just a few places. I'm, I'm somebody who, if you name any country, I'll say, oh, I want to go there. I want to learn about <laughs> their artists. So um, I'm just excited in general. But, um, yeah, no, those are some of the places that are on my radar at the moment. Cool. Okay, great. Um, are there any preference for specific mediums or expression like uh, uh Like in general, like which sells better? Uh, because as well, like there's the theory. Okay, red sells the best, green uh, sells mm. the worst. You know, you know that they, they, and and painting goes better than uh, sculpture. And and how can you come on? Uh, come I don't a bit about quite these subscribe theories? to that. I've heard these theories before, and again, I think people have their kind of personal favorites and preferences, <laughs> psychologies, but. Um, I haven't, yeah, 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 the Fontanas, right? They all sell by... by. Exactly. Um, I guess you could say uh, paintings are probably more sought after than sculpture, just from a practical sense that, you know, not everyone has... People have wall space more than they have floor space or table space. You know, huge paintings are often difficult to sell. Video art is often difficult to sell. Not because it's not great, but because you're limiting the number of people who could, who could um, you're limiting your potential buyers for it. Yeah. Um, but you can, you know, like I say, people have such a personal reaction to, to a piece. You, I'm always surprised by who goes for what piece. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't love those rules. I guess, you know, when it comes to portraiture, a pretty young girl is probably going to make more money than a ugly ancient old man but <laughs> <laughs> I want to be proved wrong with those things um, I, yeah, I, don't like, yes. I don't like selling by formula I don't think art follows a formula so yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not so keen on that theory yeah Yeah, no, it's always interesting, like, because, like, I guess, like, as you said, like, some people are rather, like, attracted to a certain motif, motif or a certain uh, color uh, as well, like, let's maybe, let's say women are more attracted to the warm colors, men's maybe to some different colors, so I guess uh, there, there can be, like, uh, like, similarities, but probably it's not a, a common rule. You, one of the questions earlier was how, how we value artwork. Um, yes. And certainly we take all those things into consideration. So if we're yes. looking at a painting, say, we're looking at the, the size, the condition, the age, yes. whether it was exhibited before, and the subject matter. And yes. so we are thinking about those things. But one of the other things we think about is who's going to buy it. I mean, literally, do I have a buyer in mind for this 
painting. Yeah. And it's a big part of my job is knowing our clients as much as I can. Like I say, we have 200 bidders in a sale. I, I don't know them each personally, but I try to um, get to know them and their tastes and what they're looking for um, so that I can be prepared knowing when I see it, I think, oh, Oliver is going to love that. He's yeah. been looking for, yeah. you know, that still life or, you know, a 1999 yeah. <laughs> whatever, whatever it is, you know, that's, that's part of my job. So, yeah. um, the and, more and I how, know, the more I know about our collectors. Um, yeah. the, the, and how do you do this? Uh, this, let's say, this part of job. How do you do it with new uh, art? Uh, uh, that, uh, not new art. New, new artists who coming to auction. Like, um, I don't want to say any names. Like names which are, let's say, first time on auction. How do you, let's say, promote these young artists that they that they don't, let's say, drop so, out on auction? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we don't necessarily. I mean, it's it's. It's sadly not our job to promote unknown young artists. That mm -hmm. is very much the role of a gallery, and we I mm -hmm. very much respect that that role and that relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're we're a secondary marketplace, so we're we're supposed you know the artists that we're selling should already have a following. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, I, I can think of a couple of artists. So I already mentioned Entedeka Um yes. We knew when we debuted her at auction that she was going to cause a lot of excitement because yeah. all of our I mean, remember, we sell at auction, but we also sell, we have private sales. Yeah. So we have people, both the pieces that we're selling, but we also have requests, constant requests. I'm looking for a piece by this artist. The gallery says there's a waiting list. Do you know of one privately? Yeah. So we know what people are looking for. We know what artists they're looking for. And if I know that five, six, seven, eight people are looking for a work by Encheka, I know yeah. it's, it's going to do well at auction. Um, she's obviously kind of a superstar example and a really unusual example because her work is in such short supply. But another a comparable artist um, who we debuted at auction was um, Adia Lunga Kamwanga from DRC. Um, I was really unsure about putting him into sale. Yeah, He was so young um, and he exhibits at October Gallery, which is a great yeah. gallery, but small enough. Um, I mean, he's still in his 20s. And... But then I understood that, um, again, the gallery had a waiting list and there were lots of people looking for one of his pieces. And, yeah. and sure enough, you know, his his auction prices, his retail prices at the time were like $10,000 and now yeah. we've sold his work for £80,000. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a, a perfect storm when you've got an artist who's so in demand to, yeah. to come at auction. Yeah. And do you think, like, we, we had these, like, in several uh, talks here now, like, what happens to the, the the waiting lists? Like probably most of them, they let's say they get a little bit reduced. Do you think this has as well an effect then on the auction results? That, uh, for example, with Eddie, that um, let's say there are less buyers who might might be interested, and that does it like say affect on the price and the hammer price in the end too? I guess if we do our job correctly and the gallery does their job correctly, the the interest yeah. grow and grow and grow, right? You know, he's a young artist. They, that he'll have a career trajectory you know, planned out yeah. for him. He should be getting more museum shows. His museum, his um, audience should be broadening. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess I know why. The, I mean, the, the waiting lists are are frustrating, I'm sure, for, for everyone. Oh, yeah. but, Super frustrating. But it's funny. There's so much psychology in art collecting. They're frustrating, yeah. but it's also reassuring to know that everyone else wants what of you course. want, right? Yeah, it's yeah of course. It's, it's growing crop. Yeah. not bidding against anyone. They love to know someone else wants it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I know what you mean. Yes, <laughs> if you have if you have the artist, then you're like in the lucky position. If you don't have, it, then you're getting annoyed. So. <laughs> and the other thing is, I mean, if you're if you're serious about collecting, there are ways that you can support an, an, an artist and kind of follow their career beyond buying their work. You know, if, if you're a big collector, if you're really yes. invested, you can support their museum short shows. You can support the publications about their work, um, and those are all things that are going to kind of keep them. Um, at, at the top of their game and, and, and people interested in their work. Um, I, guess the, I guess the big danger is if an artist um, takes a huge career turn or if they're dropped by their gallery. Um, like I say, it's, it's really the gallery's job to, to kind of keep the momentum going and keep yeah, things okay. like going over yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay, we have 
five more minutes. Um, I don't know where to shut it down like it was last time. So, uh, it's so quick. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes Instagram is like shutting. <laughs> and so you can't say thank you. Um, thank you so much for this chance uh, now. Um, maybe you can say like uh, some last re recommendations, maybe something where you, uh, where you let's say, where you, collectors can focus on or let's say you don't need to mention any names or if you want you can say as well some names where you think like okay this could be interesting in future well i mean first of all thank you very much Oliver, for, for yeah. having me and thank you for everyone for tuning in um i'm going to promote ourselves a little bit first i would definitely visit the sotheby's website there's so much content on there we put a lot of editorial on there mm -hmm. it's all free to access you can sign up for emails Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll send you kind of um, upcoming events and sales and things. And we have a sale next week that's an online sale called Eclectic, which mm -hmm. has submissions from every single department, including contemporary African art, at really, really affordable prices. Mm -hmm. So these are quite, I mean, a, a variety of emerging and, and big name artists like mm -hmm. Antonio O, who's a big um, Angolan artist, but also Cristiano Mangovo, who's a younger Angolan artist. Um, and all those prices are at or below five thousand pounds. So if you're thinking about starting a collection or if you're an established collector, check that out. Um, otherwise, I think I mean I think we're all frustrated that we're not able to travel and get go to our exhibitions. Yes. But there is such an amazing world of content online. Um, I'm enjoying not just kind of viewing so one of the shows i was really excited about seeing this um summer was uh doro Loo's show in chicago at the um mca and they've done a virtual video of the exhibition i would check that out and um, so that kind of combines the history social history of chicago african-american art and african art um doro i think everyone knows so um London-based Nigerian um, fashion designer and married to Thelma Golden, who's like one of the most powerful curators in this field, in the African art and contemporary African art field. Um, I've also enjoyed kind of revisiting um, old exhibitions that um, a lot of museums are putting content on from years old exhibitions, which I'm really enjoying and maybe I didn't have time to kind of fully appreciate um, at the time. So. I think it's kind of a, I'm enjoying this time, this slower pace to, to do a lot of research and reading of my own. And I, I think it's a really great time to learn more about the field. Yes, I think definitely you can dig now, deep in, find your find your taste, start a collection, get into, do some art. And, and like I said Everything earlier, um, those of us at the auction houses and at the galleries, we, we're in front of our computers more. We have a little bit more time on our hands and we're probably have more time for anyone who, who comes at us with questions, whether they're sales inquiries or just kind of wanting to learn more, um, you know, use, use this opportunity, I think, to um, build on that network and, and ask the questions you've been meaning to ask. That's perfect. Everyone out there, um, if some requests, please uh, contact Hannah directly yeah. from the website. Um, Thank you so much for joining. Um, it's been a, a real pleasure getting a lot of insights from the auction world. Uh, thank you so much, even to the community. Um, I will have my next talk on Saturday, so not on Friday like normally. I will do it on Saturday. And um, thank you so much for joining, and please all take care, and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. <laughs>